بكت عيني بكت عيني بكت عيني على ذنبي وما لاقيت من كربي فيا ذلي ويا خجلي إذا ما قال لي ربي أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب uh, Today inshallah do something interesting um, the reality of history that every single generation father to son father to son can have such a different impact and especially if you look at the seerah uh, episode or the seerah reality what I find interesting every person is responsible for himself the father has very little to do with the son the son has very little to do with the father sometimes and one such example which we'll give today is a three generation uh, uh, ancestry three generation father to son each one of which has such a radically different story uh, pre sira sira post sira each one of which literally you can write an entire episode and <clears throat> they're disconnected from each other in their own way yet of course they are all you know descendants of one another so we begin with the first person in our chain in our list and that is somebody who was the equivalent of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul from the Aus Abdullah ibn Ubay Salul the leader of the hypocrites was from the Khazraj there is another figure a lot of people are not aware of his name he was the equivalent of this leader of the hypocrite but from the Aus and the Aus were the more elite and the more rich and the more prestigious than the Khazraj and the person, his name is Abu Amir al-Rahib. Abu Amir al-Rahib. Abu Amir al-Rahib converted as a pagan to Christianity. And he studied the Old Testament and New Testament. And he would be preaching Christianity to the Arabs. This is very rare to be educated, to be a priest. He called Abu Amir al-Rahib. Here means he's the priest, he's the monk. He was called Abu Amir al-Rahib because... He was educated, he was an academic, he would be preaching to the people about Christianity. And this is pre-Islam. When the Prophet ﷺ came, he negotiated with him for a bit until finally after the battle of Badr, he realized Islam is now going to spread in Medina. And he refused to convert, he never converted. So he fled to Mecca for a year or two. And in the battle of Uhud, he told the Quraysh, that just wait when I speak to my people of the Aus they will not fight against you he, he said to the Quraysh you don't know my standing amongst my people I have a level of respect that when I tell them to not fight they will listen to me if you remember the wars of the Bu'ath I've been over this before if you remember the civil war everybody from the leaders had been decimated except for four or five he's one of them he is of a different generation than all of the youngsters. And he considers himself to be the leader of the Aus and the most respected and the one whom people would listen to. So he said to the Quraysh, just you wait, take me with you. When we get in front of the army, I will make sure the Aus leave. So when the battle of Uhud takes place, he goes outside and he yells to the people, oh people of Aus, you know who I am. I am Abu Amir, I am Abu Amir. And I am telling you that you cannot fight. You have to come over to the side of the Quraysh. Well, obviously, Iman has spread in the Aus now. They're not going to listen to him. So the Prophet ﷺ, uh, said, don't listen to Abu Amr al-Fasiq. Switch the name from al-Rahib to Fasiq. The Fasiq means the, the evil person. And so because of this, the Aus said, Oh, Abu Amr al-Fasiq, get away from us. We, are, we don't know you anymore. You're not a part of us anymore. And he was shocked to see this change of his people from kufr to iman. Now his people had rejected him. And he turned back to the Quraysh. He goes, I don't know. My people have changed after me. And they have changed. They have now become Muslim. And Abu Amr then fled to Heraclius because he was who he was. He had a position with him. And in the palace of Heraclius, he began communicating with the munafiqun. It was his idea to build the... Masjid of the Munafiqun that the Quran mentions in Surah Tabuk. That, that masjid is called in the Quran. Who can remind me? Masjid Dirar. That was his idea. 
Masjid Dirar was his idea because he's the intellectual brains. He was the one who sent, some people say even the finances, he was the one who sent the idea. You need to have a base and a camp outside. You need to do this and that. So they're the ones who then instituted it. And Abdullah ibn Ubay took charge, but the idea came from Abu Amir. And Allah Azza wa revealed in the Quran, you had better not ever visit Masjid Dirar. لا تقوم فيه أبدا. And the verses are well known to you. So Abu Amr al-Rahib was this person, Abu Amr al-Fasiq, and he passed away in Rome. He never returned to Medina, he passed away uh, the same year as the Battle of Tabuk. This is one generation. Died a kafir and one of the worst of the people of uh, Kufr from Medina. His son, all of you know. His son, all of you know. He has a story that is well famous in the seerah, but a lot of people don't connect him to his father, obviously. His son is Hamvala, the one whom the angels washed in the battle of Uhud. Subhanallah, the father is on the other side of the camp, telling his people, don't fight, you know, uh, with the Prophet Sallallahu And his son Hamvala is one of the most famous shaheed on the other side of the camp. His son Hamdala, as you, you know, remember, the, remember the story, he was a young man, you know, maybe 19, 20 years old. And he had already, the, the, the date of the marriage had already been decided. It was actually, coincidentally, the, 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 the days of the battle of Uhud. Now, who was the betrothed? A lot of people, again, don't know this interesting tidbit. Who was Abu Amr's best friend in the days of Jahiliyyah? Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul. So, Abdullah ibn Abi Salul and Abu Amir had had a, an agreement from back in the day. My son will marry your daughter. And they actually thought this would be a mechanism of overcoming the civil war. Because Aus and Khazraj, the two leaders, right? This was actually a historic marriage. Decided as they were children. They're going to be like, we're going to overcome the animosity between our two tribes. So, Hamvala, the leader, sorry, the son of the leader of the Aus, marries Jamila. Binti Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. Subhanallah, can you believe, right? The two Ra's al Kufr and Nifaq, their sons and daughters get married. The marriage was decided back in the day. It just so happens the, the days of Uhud, they get married. And so the Prophet was out in Uhud camping. And Hamdallah said, Ya Rasulullah, you know, my marriage is coming up. Can I just, you know, come back to the city, you know, get married, and then meet you guys, you know, the next day? Can I get permission to be a newlywed? So the Prophet said, okay, it's your marriage. Bismillah. One night, go spend in the city, then come and meet us. You all know the story. He spent the night with his wife, prepares for battle, wears the armor. He's about to leave and his wife clings on to him. Obviously, understandably, she's a newlywed, what not. Clings on to him, don't leave, what not. You know, she's a newlywed. And in the passion of the moment, once again, you know, the act occurs and there's no time to do ghusl. So he then leaves without having done ghusl. And he goes to the battle of Uhud and he dies on that battle. The Sahaba discover his body. And of course, Uhud is a dry area, nothing over there. And they find drops of water glistening on him. And the Prophet ﷺ said that go ask his wife, something doesn't make sense to me. I see the angels doing ghusl and the shaheed, you don't do ghusl for, right? This must be another reason. I see the angels doing ghusl. There must be a story here. And so his wife said that, well, I, you know, what is, I clinged on to him and whatnot, and he didn't do ghusl before he left for the battle. So that's why he was called Hanvala Ghasilul Malaika. This is the son of, of who? Abu Amr al Rahib. And uh, the son of the uh, um, Jamila binti Abdullah ibn Abi Salul. Uh, sorry, so he marries Jamila bint Abdullah ibn Salul. Now, how long were they married? MashaAllah, 12 hours. Okay, from that 12 hour union comes our third generation candidate, literally one after the other. SubhanAllah. Abu Amir, his son Hanzala, his story, we all know it. Then his son, Abdullah ibn Hanzala ibn Abi Amir. Okay, these are the three people Abu Amir, Hanzala, and Abdullah. And Abdullah's story is completely like interesting and fascinating and tragic and sad very long lectures can be given i'll summarize for you inshallah the point again you see reality of history how every generation completely different person right so abdullah is of course i mean how can he not be respected and famous when his birth story is this story can you imagine right yeah this is how he is born so his title his laqab was 
Ibn al-Ghasil, the son of Ghasil al-Malaika, Ibn al-Ghasil. People would call him Ibn al-Ghasil. That was his laqab, his title for his entire life. The son of the Ghasil of Malaika, Ibn al-Ghasil. His name is Abdullah, but his becomes his title. And uh, in the next generation, he rises up to prominence and the people of Medina, the Ansar, take him as an unofficial leader. Now, during this time frame, if you remember your history, or if not, I'll teach you, there was a lot of civil war and strife going on, a lot of issues going on. And by and large, Medina tried its best to maintain a sense of neutrality. And Medina was the bastion of ilm and the highest concentration of Sahaba, obviously, and the highest concentration of the sons and grandsons of the Sahaba. Obviously, no other city in the world had that level of piety and taqwa and had the, the, the number of Sahaba. It's understood, this is Medina, right? And so in that environment, Abdullah ibn Hanzara rises up to prominence. He becomes basically a, a community leader, somebody of respect, somebody whose word is taken as authority. Now, the, uh, uh, the Khalifa Muawiyah uh, passes away and Yazid comes in charge. When Yazid comes in charge, Ibn Zubayr is in Mecca. And there is tension, obviously. There's a splitting away uh, of Yazid and, uh, and Ibn Zubayr. The people of Medina are wondering, what should we do? Where should we put our lot? Yazid or Ibn Zubayr? Or what do we do? Or even go independent. So Yazid sends a request to Abdullah ibn Hanzara. Come as my visitors. I shall honor you. I shall show you karam. And you'll be my personal guest. I guarantee your safety and let's discuss. So a delegation of the elite of the Ansar leaves from Medina to Damascus. Its head is Ibn al-Ghasil, the one we're talking about. And he brings all eight of his sons. He has eight sons. He brings all eight of his sons and a few more dignitaries. The entire group is basically him and his eight sons. And for, I don't know, a week, it doesn't mention how long, a week, two weeks, Yazid, you know, well, we, we want to say wine and dine, but he dined them, right? Gave them karam, gave them every. He gave a hundred thousand dinars to Abdullah and ten thousand to every one of the sons as a gift. Of course, you know what is the purpose of the gift, right? It is to do what? It's a bribe. It's an ayah. It's like, here, just come with me. And wanted to convince him to join the side because Medina is Medina. And it has a historic and it has a, you know, high status. So Abdullah bin Hamdara is the one who's chosen and negotiations, blatant bribing, whatnot. And they're listening and paying attention. On the way back down, they begin discussing amongst themselves they're really not comfortable at all. They don't like what they've seen. Now, again, this is in the books of history. It raises a whole bunch of questions. But honestly, it was history says whether you like it or not. It was mutawatir back in the day. They were talking about the fact he's not praying on time, the fact he's a drunkard, the fact... A long list of stuff which, brutally honest, for our times, if a leader were to do this, is relatively trivial. Okay? So what if he's drinking compared to the realities of the dictators of today? But... Back in their time frame, the Sahaba and sons of the Sahaba, to have somebody in charge who is coming out drunk to lead the Salah, it's like inconceivable to them, right? And other, you know, things of this nature that they do not like this at all. On the way back down to Medina, the death of Hussein radiallahu anh reaches them. And the massacre of Karbala. This has just happened. You know, I, would, I went over the story of Karbala here. The massacre of Karbala reaches them. Khalas. This is now obvious. There is no way they're going to join Yazid. No way. In fact, Abdullah bin Hanbala said, Akhsha, I am scared if we join that person that Allah will rain stones on us as punishment. Yani, people need to understand there's, a, there's an attempt in our times to reclaim history, to re-sanitize history. Look, the books are very clear. This person was despised by the righteous people. I mean, it's very clear. It's pretty obvious. And frankly, I don't know why there's a controversy. He's not a Sahabi. He's not, he never saw the process. He's not a Sahabi. So he was a leader of the leaders. As Ibn Taymiyyah said, that 
His dhulm was relatively small compared to later's. But the issue is the people he did this dhulm to were the Sahaba and the sons of the Sahaba. So it becomes massive because the concept of a tyrannical ruler, everybody has that. But to be tyrannical against Hussein, عنه, to be tyrannical against the people of Medina, now you're talking about a whole different thing. He was a king amongst kings, but his dhulm was against the best of all people. That was the problem. So... Abdullah bin Hanzala, what does he say? No way we're going to join this person. Comes back to Medina, gives the announcement in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. Can you imagine history? The same bricks that the Prophet ﷺ prayed, the masjid hasn't changed. The same structure. And he says, I want to say publicly that we shall never give the oath to Yazid. And anybody who's given the oath, not welcome here anymore. And Yazid's cousin, the grandson of Abu Sufyan, was the governor. Abdullah bin Hanzala, because the Umayyads, Abdullah bin Hanzala takes a group, a crowd, mob, and attacks the house and expels, get out of here. You know, the grandson of Abu Sufyan, get out of here. I have nothing to do with you, we're breaking, breaking away. So they broke away, and they're thinking, should they form an alliance with Ibn Zubayr or not? But right now, they are independent right now. So Medina is independent. Somebody says, oh Abdullah, you took 100,000 from Yazid. And your sons took 10,000. I mean, you took all of that money. And he said, yes, I took it in order to finance rebellion against him. Now put yourself in, well, do not put yourself in the shoes of Yazid, but imagine how Yazid would feel, right? Imagine how Yazid would feel. I invited you. I wined and dined you. I did everything to you. I gave you all of this while you're with me. Yes, all of this, laughing, what not. The minute you turn back and you go to Medina, this is what you do. And because he was Ibn al Ghasil, the entire city of Medina basically agrees with him. Yani his level of respect was so powerful that he says it and khalas, that's it. This is who he was. And he's 63 years old. Six, no, sorry, 62 years old, 61, 62 years old. So, they decided we're not going to give the bay'ah to Yazid. Yazid is Yazid. He's a king. He is who he is. He sends the largest army that the Hijaz has ever seen. 12,000 soldiers. And he puts in charge Muslim Ibn Uqba. Muslim was later called Musrif as his title. The books of history called him Musrif, the transgressor. He's not a Muslim. Musrif, the transgressor. And he says to Muslim that offer Abdullah ibn Hanzala the option of unconditional surrender. We're not going to tell him. We're not going to tell him the conditions. He has to have either you surrender and you leave your fate to us or else attack. And if he refuses to surrender, Yazid said the famous remark that I give you three days. Do as you please to the city and the inhabitants and the belongings of Medina. 12,000 troops. Do as you please. And then when you're done, go on to Mecca and fight Ibn Zubair. The same army is going to go and fight Ibn Zubair. This was the infamous Battle of Harra, which is one of the biggest tragedies of early Islam. And if you go visit Baqi al Gharqad, Baqi al Gharqad, there's a special place over there in which they say, over here are buried all of the martyrs of Harra. There's not individual graves, there's a pit. And all of the thousands of bodies were just put in there. 12,000 soldiers against, against who? The sons and grandsons of the Sahaba, but they're not soldiers, they're civilians. 12,000 military men march down, surround the city. The message comes, Yazid is saying, unconditional surrender or else. And Abdullah bin Hamdullah once again stands in front of the, 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 the people in the Masjid al-Prasas and says that, O oh people, we will never give bay'ah to this person. We're upon the truth. This person is evil. Da, 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 I'm never going to do this. And all of the Sahaba sons, there are still Sahaba alive at this time. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri is alive. All of the Sahaba, sons of the Sahaba, grandsons of the Sahaba, they were in Yunan. We're not going to give the oath to this person. And if we're going to have to stand up and fight, so be it. We learn from history, subhanAllah, civilians cannot take on the army. You learn across the world, right? No matter how pious you are, no matter which masjid you take refuge in, even the masjid of the Prophet or the masjid of another Sahabi, whatever, let's not get into politics today. But you get my point here. Civilians cannot stand up against an evil, brutal, brutal dictatorship. 
learn from history, even though truth is on their side, even though our hearts are with the civilians, even though our du'as are with the civilians, is it wise? We're not saying who has the right. To, we learn from history. They thought, they literally thought they would win. Miracle. They thought Allah is going to send angels, whatever it might be. This is human nature. And it's fine to think like this, but let us learn from history. So subhanAllah, what happened, happened. One of the most brutal and painful incidents, the massacre of Harra. And the troops entered the city, did what they did. I've given a whole lecture, you can listen to it online. It's called Some Incidents from the First Century of the Hijrah. I didn't even have the, I didn't want to put explicit things in the title. It's comments are closed and it's an advanced academic talk. Some Incidents in the First Century of the Hijrah. You can find it online. And I talked about the incident of Harra, one of the most painful things. And Abdullah ibn Hanzala ibn Abi Amir, he saw every one of his sons die in front of his eyes, one after the other. The lineage is gone. There is no person left of that tribe, mini tribe now, because, because of the battle of Harra. Every single son of Abdullah ibn Hanzala dies in front of his eyes. And he, by the way, during the days of Harra, he, that, was, that was who he was. He would be fasting every day, praying to Hajjud the whole night, and he slept in the Masjid of the Prophet as his base. The base of the battle was the Masjid of the Prophet And that's where the troops were, well, meaning troops, meaning the people. How long are you going to last? A few days. That's all it lasted. You can't stand against 12,000 troops. The troops march in, and one by one, everybody dies until finally it is just Abdullah bin Hanbala and five or six people. And... He realizes nothing can be done here. So he takes his armor off and he takes his sword and he charges at the troops of Yazid. And khalas, that was the end of his line. And you know, subhanAllah, he dies in the battle of Harra and he is buried in Baqi' in that pit where they had to dig for the people of Harra. Anyway, pur purpose of today's khatira was to show you how history, qadr of Allah, every generation and every person is some complete, completely different. And this is the reality of life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and protect our, our children and grandchildren. May Allah azza wa jalla allow us and our children and grandchildren to have a positive legacy, to carry the torch of iman. May Allah allow every one of our progeny to be a qurra ainin to us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and guide our children and grandchildren after us. Until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Faya dhulli wa ya khajali إذا ما قال لي ربي أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى رضا الرب تعود إلى رضا الرب